All right. Well, it's eight oh two Eastern, and I know uh, our team had a couple of last minute uh, items come up, um, a, a personal issue for one of our members of our team, and a scheduling conflict. But we've got three of the Wookies here from Wolf Capital Management. Uh, myself, Rod Alsman, the managing director. We have our COO, Han, and a member of our team, JP. Um, unfortunately, Joe and John uh, will not be able to join. It does not appear due to some last-minute issues, conflicts. But we're going to go ahead and hopefully have a good discussion on Seth Klarman's margin of safety for this, our third rendition of our Wook Book Club, which I am just going to read a disclaimer that I need to get out of the way um, before we start the conversation. So I just want to ensure that everyone knows that Wook Capital Management Inc. and its employees solely provide investment advisory services to family clients and do not provide investment advisory services to the general public. Furthermore, investments are highly speculative in nature and involve substantial risk of loss. We encourage investors to obtain advice from your professional investment advisor and to make independent investigations before acting on information that we publish. We cannot guarantee you that the information is accurate or complete. We do not in any way warrant or guarantee the success of any action you take in reliance on our statements or recommendations. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results and all investment decisions of an individual remain the specific responsibility of that individual. Okay, um, with that mouthful out of the way, Let's talk about margin of safety. Uh, it is both a great read as well as a philosophy that Mr. Klarman underpins his investment thinking with. And it's hard to argue. Uh, Bow Post, the hedge fund that he is uh, at, has uh, performed really incredibly well over its four decades with a compound annual growth rate uh, somewhere in the high teens. I've seen it ranging from 16 and a half, uh, I think, depending on, I guess, when your start and end point is. But but either way, no matter how you slice it, over four decades, uh, I've heard they only had four down years. And obviously that rate of return is far in excess of any large cap uh, index that you could benchmark them to during that time. And... Um, I think it goes without saying that it's really difficult to, to do really well in investing to outperform the market over a long period of time. So we'll talk about hopefully some of the key insights Mr. Klarman wrote about, even though he wrote about the, the wrote this and about 30 years ago, I think the fundamental uh, underpinning of the book is still very relevant today. The approach he takes, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not, I guess, in line with how the market had acted much of the last couple of years, his value oriented margin of safety investment philosophy. But uh, as, as 22 rolled by with some ser serious losses for the indices, I think more folks are maybe the pendulum is swinging back toward value investing. Um, but yeah, so at my intention for formatting uh, anyone who is in the audience, you're, you're absolutely welcome to chime in. I really don't want this to just be a back and forth between the Wook team. I would really like uh, anyone, you, whether you're an office investor, you, whether you read the book or didn't read the book, hopefully if, if you're listening over the next hour or so um, and you hear some things that resonate with you and, and share, uh, you know, how that, how you're thinking about things. Maybe if you did read the book, some thoughts on the book, et cetera. So um, loosely, I'm going to kind of pose questions that uh, the book kind of inherently makes you think about to different members of the team. And again, I, I would welcome anyone who, who wants to raise their hand um, to come up as a speaker and, uh, and yeah, and share their thinking. So um, Han, I know I've shared in our team discord earlier a question. So I will start us off, I guess. Um, in that vein so that, like the first chapter in the book um you've got clarman going in uh sorry i'm trying to add um 
Hold on, let me make you you and JP co-host so I can try and manage uh, speaking <laughs> and not trying to do three things at once here. Um, yeah, so the, the first chapter of the book opens up with kind of his thinking on the difference between, uh, you know, a speculation and investing. And he talks about collectibles, artwork, antiques, rare coins, baseball cards. Uh, if he'd written this book 30 years later, I'm sure he would have thrown NFTs into the mix. And he notes none, that those are not investments. They are, in his words, rank speculations. So um, what would you say, in your opinion, is the difference between investing and speculating? I shared Klarman's view um, or, or rather, I shared what speculation would be. Um, in his view, you know, an investor expects to profit either from the free cash flow that a business is generating, which would either be reflected in a higher share price or a dividend distribution uh, from the multiple investors are willing to pay for the underlying business increasing for some reason or another, or from the gap between the share price and underlying business value narrowing assuming that it trades at a discount. Now, those are the only ways that his view investors can profit in the market. So again, I'll, I'll pose the question. I'll answer if, if, if no one wants to, I guess. Um, but the question being, you know, what is the difference? What is that fine line between investing and speculating? Uh, is it a time horizon? Is it a mentality? Uh, you know, how do you see it? The way I see it is... Uh... Sorry, by the way. Uh, hi, 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 everyone. My name is Han. I'm the CEO of Wook. Um, to, to respond to, to Rod, um, the main difference between investing and trading is less about the time horizon, but the mindset for me. Um, you know, echoing what Clarendon has said in this book, um, it keeps going back to the example of trading sardines, right? So never bothering to taste the sardines they are trading. This is the main issue uh, when it comes to speculating is that People are only focusing on owning the sardines because they are going up in price. Um, and that greedy tendency to own whatever is going, uh, going up in price is what fuels speculation and is what makes speculation different from investing inherently. Uh, because in investing, you have to know where the sardines are coming from, what the sardines taste like. Um, and if you know more people are going to want sardine in the future because what they taste like, not because they're fact that they're just going up in price um so so in my in my view um it has to do with the mindset of whether the person putting the money in into the sardines is willing to learn more about what these tastes like um, and what the product actually is instead of just responding to the greedy tendency um that that client talks about in his book Yeah, that's a good, that's a, and I know that that's an example that's used in um, mainstream, I guess, finance today, that that idea of trading sardines. I, I actually don't know offhand if it was originated from Carmen's book or if it's an older saying, but, but that idea of trading sardines, it, it, it is less about the duration, more about the mentality. Right, right. I would agree. I think I've seen and, this and it's, it's hard. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll admit, and I'll, I'll admit it that I've, I, I'm, I fashion myself as an investor, but I've participated in far more speculations uh, during the last couple of years mania than I would have liked. Very easy to succumb to the allure of upside of, of returns with a view that maybe the risks are, are minimal and the returns are large. And um, you, you, It's not to say that traders can't be, I guess, successful or can't make money, but it's, it's I guess the distinction is you know, one is basing it uh you know what you think is going to happen based on the underlying uh business or the sardine and the other one doesn't really care at all about the quality of the sardine the taste of the sardine the you know the, the competitive landscape impacting the sardines and other fish it, it's simply what can i sell this for i think someone's going to pay more for it <laughs> right right uh, i think yeah we've seen this theme in other books that we read as well um you know the the idea of just just flipping this little trade and the only thing that 
speculators try to do is they just sell it to the next um, next dumbest person who's willing to pay the highest price. Um, and this is the theme that I think we will keep uh, coming back to you know, throughout our book club discussion, um, because really at the heart um, of being a good investor lies the ability to tell the difference between um, between uh, investment with actual value versus investment with no value. And, you know, going back to your example, Rod, about NFT, you know, obviously people are very split um, in this topic. And I think, you know, largely, like, you know, a large part of um, the past two years during this NFT boom, you know, the, the, discuss the debate um, was mainly between people arguing that NFT will have future value um, and it is, um, you know, like a very sure way of assigning value to something that otherwise would not have value versus people who are saying this is just the, just the fad. Um, so we're, we're not at that, like we're not there yet to conclude um, whether this is going to work or not. But it's a very good example um, just to see like how many people piled onto the idea of an NFT and then just really treating as um, the trading sardines, something that they can just sell to the next dumb person um, who's willing to pay versus really holding on to it and, and seeing what the application, what the real value um, would be in the future. I think even beyond the prospect of non-fungible tokens not being a fad and there being real utility aspects for their usage, I think the distinction Klarman would draw is that it's not an investment. It's a. It's inherently a speculation, just like buying that Hank Aaron rookie baseball card is a speculation. That piece of paper or that digital file stored on the blockchain, now those are not businesses one invests in that return profits to owners. They are inherently um, speculative instruments that derive their value uh, from whatever someone's willing to pay, which gold is kind of in that as well. Um, your jewelry, your, you know, these, these items that it's what a buyer is willing to pay, which doesn't mean you cannot make money trading those things. Again, it, it's just that, that big distinction between investment uh, and speculation, which you can have fads that are, <laughs> that come in and out of uh, favor, but that, there are, are always going to be, I guess, speculations. It's just a matter of are they even going to be around long enough for another batch of traders to get those sardines moved? Right, right. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great example. You know, all the all the collectibles that trade in the market now. You know, um, like many of the great investments don't have any function. Like like your example of baseball cars, or you know, like the Pokemon cars, or even just like fine art. I don't know there's no um, immediate function, but they still keep trading with very high value, and that's only because, um, like like exactly what you said, Rod, the main value from these um, speculative assets comes from the fact that other people will value um, at the you know higher price than what you paid for it, um, and this is exactly why. Uh, and, and and there are so many speculative assets, and I. You know, in my opinion, these days, it just gets more and more difficult to distinguish between what's speculative and what's not. So, you know, it's more important than ever to always think about margin of safety and think about your entry and price and how we can better get a, a discount on an asset that we think has more value. So what you just said there on um, the end sounded a lot like something I think we've heard from Howard Marks in the most important thing, and, and I know Klarman talks about it as well, that there's just no such thing as a bad, um, I don't want to misquote it. Let me see if I can find the quote. It was along the lines of there's no such thing as a, a bad, I guess, a good or bad investment. It's just the price you pay, really. Uh, in essence, that's kind of the message um, that they both make, that with Marx obviously talking about how when he came of age, uh, junk bonds you know, were, were a new thing and nobody would touch them. Certain financial professionals wouldn't touch speculative grade bonds. So therefore, um, you know, in those individuals' view, there was no good price for those assets. 
Whereas in Mark's view and, and Carmen's, you know, these these assets maybe are have higher risk, but at a certain price, you're getting compensated for bearing that risk. And in fact, um, you know, the, that's the best, I guess, type of fit, pool to be fishing in a pool where other people aren't willing to stick their poles in to try and catch because they think that those fish are bad because of whatever preconceived notion. So, yeah, um, let me, let me keep building then. Uh, we obviously kind of talked on some of the first chapter points with, with the speculation versus you know, investment discussion. Um, you know, Klarman definitely goes, uh, he definitely doesn't have a, a supremely favorable view of Wall Street. He makes it clear uh, in his writing that Wall Street is there for, and he notes the compensation structure, right? The incentives typically are what guide the actions. So you know, the nature of Wall Street works against investors is the chapter two headline. And he notes that it's largely compensated for activity. Um, a good a good point he raises is that IPOs and new issues are always being stacked against the buyers. So we had a lot of IPO, we had a back boom um, <clears throat> in the last couple of years, where you know these you have to think about it. Okay, these these wonderful investments are being marketed to investors, and and. Then, it kind of beggars the question of if these are so wonderful, why is somebody trying to sell it to you? <laughs> um, and you know, there was record levels of new issues in the market in the preceding few years. And activities, of course, come down meaningfully in 2022. But something Carmen does kind of note, and uh, you know, I, I will confess, I bought shares of a couple of recent uh, IPO companies in the last couple of years. And I think Carmen's does make a very good point. And, and it, it, a reality is that you know, why are these being sold when they're being sold? They're probably being sold because the you know, market conditions are attractive for them to get a higher price, um, you know, to sell into a frothy market perhaps, um, which isn't to say that any company that IPOs or, or goes public via SPAC is a bad company, but that you, you may want to be skeptical and wait a few years, you know, even if you're interested in the technology or whatever. Um, so you know, that, I think that that's an interesting point from margin of safety that um, is maybe worth thinking on or, and talking on a little bit. Of, right, um, right. Steering clear of new issues. I think one thing we should uh, probably make clear for our listeners is that this, this book is really old. You know, it's one of the, one yeah. of the most classic uh, investment books of all time, and it, uh, to me, when I, when I first read it, it was it was shocking to me how relevant some of these examples are, and how um, how all these examples of bad investments kind of keep repeating that that theme over and over again. Um, and you know, uh, like Clarman says in, in the book, you know, what appears to be new and improved today may prove to be flawed. Um, this was true way back when, when you know, IPOs were you know, much, uh, I guess, newer in general in the market and other uh, financial instruments that uh, Clarence talks about in the book were, were newer. Um, now, obviously, they're very different. Um, the market has uh, has been, the, the financial market in general is, is a much more level playing field than before. But there are new new things that constantly get imp- uh, get introduced to the market that prove to be flawed. For example, um, I, I like uh, the Ripple um, example, the XRP. Um, if you guys are familiar, this is the uh, one, one, this is the the crypto that uh, had the main mission of streamlining all the uh, like international payments. This was going to be the new um, kind of uh, currency, and this was going to dramatically reduce the time taken um, between two parties to settle a payment. Um, so their their whole value proposition was that you know, a wire payment from a country X to country Y takes a couple of days and there's no transparency of where the money is going, how the mechanism is working once the wire gets initiated. So if you use an XRP to send the money, then you know it's instant, it's trackable, blah, blah, blah. And when this was first being introduced, the idea of shortening the time um, taken uh, for 
any, any kind of payment around the world, and also being able to track the status、um, while the payment is being processed, they both sound very reasonable. They both sound like new,、um, you know, new functions that the entire world, the entire market could benefit from. And that's why people were treating it as the people were giving it more value. People were thinking that it's going to solve the problem that we have. But turns out that the problem you know, wasn't really a problem to begin with. Like the world, turns out the world functions、uh, just fine with that delay and you know, less, trans- less transparency within、um, that payment、um, processing. And, and so Ripple and XRP, you know, they, they're still around, but it's, it's much less of a thing that everyone, than, than every, what everyone initially expected. So I think it's a great example of you know, people piling in to. Thinking that this will dramatically improve something that we're doing today, but you know,、um, it turns out that, that it didn't really improve and, and it, there were flaws in the system. So, going straight back to Karnan's point、um, about these new products that get introduced to the financial market that people rave about, people pile their money into, and you know, more often than not, they turn out to be. There, there turn out, turns out to be there's some kind of flaws. Yeah. <clears throat> He obviously, again, as you noted, the book was published in 1991. I was,、uh, I was all of two years old when the book came out. So I, you know, the, it, it is actually impressive to me what you noted, Han, that the book is still pretty darn relevant and readable 30 plus years later.、Um, he, you know, one thing he makes a point of where he's wrong, frankly. Because、um, he does make a point, I, I think, in line with what you're just saying, it's hard to distinguish between an investment fad from a real business trend. And when new IPOs or new companies are kind of showing us all these bright and shiny, here's what the future is going to look like, I think that's where a c l a r m a n will try to be more grounded in the approach of, you know, there's clearly downside risks for this lovely story that's being told not to go the way that. Uh, it, 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 it's being portrayed. You know, but he makes a point that is, is clearly wrong 30, you know, with 30 years of hindsight. Quote, I believe that indexing will turn out to be just another Wall Street fad. When it passes, the prices of securities in popular indices will almost certainly decline relative to those that have been excluded. Well,、uh, it's, you know, it's 2023. Index investing, passive investing continues to take share from active.、Um, It's uh, so you know, he, he was wrong on that call, but um, yeah, uh, right, that was definitely that one that of the things that I is,、um... is a bad thing, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, I, I remember reading that part, and yeah, in, index funds, and but it does like it, it makes sense in the book, you know, when he explains why it. It will not be a thing later, but it clearly is these days.、Um, so, you know, that's like you said, that's one point that,、uh, that he missed here.、Um, but, but yeah, but this theme of、um, new, new funds, new, new investments, new kind of, you know, new, always new financial derivatives that are too complex for people to understand that are being pushed by fund managers to. You know, Zero day x r e e options are the newest one. Don't know that that's going to be a fad, whether it's a good or a bad thing. <laughs> well, I guess we'll see. <laughs> I think it's clear, though, through, through those sorts of products that, again, the Wall Street firm is typically profiting off of the activity. Whether it's the commission or the volume or selling the order flow or whatever, as opposed to, again, all of these are trading and speculating related activities that aren't, you know, in, that aren't grounded in a value investment philosophy. So I'll, I'll skip the conversation forward a little bit through the book because I'm, I'm reading my, I'm looking at my notes through kind of like chapter by chapter. But before we shift to that value investment philosophy section and, Kind of how to, I guess, think with a margin of safety and you know, invest with a margin of safety.、Um, he, I guess, I'll just make a couple other points on kind of in his setup. So we talked about the first and second chapter a little bit. 
the third chapter talks about the institutional performance derby, which I think is very important to consider in what's going on in the markets right now. You had a lot of funds that were down meaningfully in 2022, and now you have the strongest January in many years for at least the NASDAQ index going back to 2001, I believe, uh, which 2001 was a horrible year by the end of the year, the index. But you, you have you know, these institutional investors that in 1991 were still ascendant um, over the last couple of decades at that time. Clearly, the institutional investors have even more firepower today. You know, they are bureaucratic by nature. They are typically not trying to stick out from the crowd. They, um, in the book, he talks about an example, which is obviously no longer with us, but the portfolio insurance strategy, which ended up being a debacle in the 1987 crash. Um, but you know, his, his points are that you know the nature of Wall Street works against investors. It, institutions are very much on this kind of performance derby approach, and that uh, there's you know, there's very much always ways that Wall Street's trying to concoct uh, things that you know can, they can sell. And it, 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 the fourth champ, chapter being about junk bonds. And again, with what we said earlier, it's not that all speculative grade bonds are bad, um, but things obviously in the '80s got a little crazy there. And <laughs> you know, he he does chide um, one of Warren Buffett's least favorite measures, the EBITDA measure. So he, he says, quote, after tax income plus that portion of earnings for interest and taxes going to pay interest expenses, a company's true cash flow derived from the ongoing income stream. So um, you know, EBIT less the or after tax, um, which would be net operating profit after tax, less that interest is what he thinks of as the true ongoing income stream as opposed to something like EBITDA, which might look bigger, but uh, those those depreciation costs are real costs for most businesses, and as is interest, as many have seen. So, okay, um, let me shift then forward through the book, Value Investment Philosophy. So he starts this section of the book off talking about defining your investment goals. And I think he makes a very astute observation that, quote, an investor who earns 16% annual returns over a decade, for example, will perhaps surprisingly end up with more money than an investor who earns 20% a year for nine years and then loses 15% the 10th year. So I think that's really interesting because it, sh it highlights how impactful loss will and can be on performance. Clearly no one is gonna only go up. Up only gang exists in strange crypto chat rooms and uh, in mania. Up only is not a real thing. Uh, you will have down years. There will always be drawdowns. I think, I know Buffett's talked about, you know, if you're not willing to tolerate a 50% drawdown, you shouldn't be investing. But, but his point that you could earn 16% you know, for 10 years straight, or you earn 20% for nine and then lose 15 out of 10 and you end up worse. I think it's, it's really interesting and you should get back to you know, why are you investing? Um, you know, are you investing to, uh, you, you know, for him, I think it all starts and for Buffett as well, it starts with preserving the hard earned capital that you've accumulated. So before thinking about the return, uh, you know, the, the idea of preservation, because it doesn't matter if you have some blowout years, if all of a sudden you have a minus you know, 70%, 80% wipeout that, that sets you back or behind square one. Right. I think on that note, um, Clarence said something that really resonated with me is that um, I think too many investors target a desired rate of return. Um, especially the value investors who think long term, you know, they they understand the power of compounding. They understand that with, um, you know, reasonable return every year, they'll you know exponentially grow their money and then be successful. Um, and and that's the right mindset. But Clarence says that rather than targeting a desired rate of return, even an eminently reasonable one, investors should target risk 
and this is something that that I personally um, have haven't thought of much uh, before reading this because um, you know like everyone else, I would only focus on just ending the year at a certain percentage or just making sure that I make some money and focusing less on managing risk and focusing on creating that margin of safety by waiting for the right moment to acquire an asset um, at a steep discount. And it's a, it's a simple concept to target risk than, you know, more than a desired rate of return. It's a very simple concept, but I think it's something that we all um, you know, often forget as we think long term. And it was really hard for quite a few years in the last, I mean, really, I guess, for, for most of the post great financial crisis era, when you really couldn't get any return in riskless investment, like short term interest rates being so low, you know, it forced many uh, investors to bear more risk than maybe they realized they were taking on. And obviously, they were rewarded uh, as as valuations kept expanding, and it's obviously a question mark, and none of us know where things go from here. But um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm just looking at some other quotes of Klarman's. Um, you know, it, it's funny he I have I bolded and underlined this one. The entire strategy can be concisely described as buy a bargain and wait in terms of his. Uh, margin of safety, value investment oriented philosophy, which you know, is, is boring. It's not exciting. It's not sexy to find a great business that's trading at a bargain price and wait, right? I think we as people, especially in a very hyperactive 21st century we live in, uh, are, are kind of incentivized in our daily lives to do more rather than do less. So it's a little counterintuitive maybe to think of it as as simple as look at under a lot of rocks, find the ones that have the best bargains and buy them and be patient (laughs) until they get to a a more fair valuation. Absolutely. Absolutely. uh, Another quote uh, from, from Clarina that um, at least this, uh, an investor cannot decide to think harder or put in overtime in order to achieve a higher return. All an investor can do is follow a consistently disciplined and rigorous approach. Over time, the returns will come. I think this is a, this beautifully relates to exactly what you're talking about, Rod. You know, it's these days, yeah, exactly like what you said. We're incentivized to do more and then do less, and because of that, it's harder to keep the discipline to you know to look under the rock every day and find a true bargain because all that information that gets pushed to us, you know. It's, it's it just snowballs um, so quickly and, and trends come and go um, and, and it just gets harder and harder to keep the discipline to, to keep doing the research that, that we always try to do. Um, so really the, the investors that will survive in the long term are the ones who are able to filter out all the noise and you know, consistently try to find opportunities using these classical um, methods to, to approach. Yeah, he he notes that sometimes a value investor will review in depth a great many potential investments without finding a single one that is sufficiently attractive. Such persistence is necessary. However, since value is often well hidden, and then he follows that up uh, in the same chapter, above all, investors must avoid swinging at bad pitches. And that's, you know, the baseball analogy is one that Buffett makes, and Carmen's obviously also a, a fan of Buffett's a friend of Buffett's and, and notes that you, know, you don't have to chase anything, right? I mean, if, if you don't get sufficiently comfortable with the research you put in with you know, the, the relative safety of buying that asset, you don't have to. You, you know, the nice thing for, for those of us who are you know, individual investors, we're not managing other people's money, uh, we don't have to worry about trying to you know, outperform um, maybe an index. Uh, you know, his point about what you brought up about absolute return re- rather than relative return. It, it is a good, it is a good one, and it's a quandary. Obviously, we've 
and we've got a, from a professional side as book capital we've we've got that kind of consideration of you know how are we benchmarking ourselves but but you know the in, individual investor doesn't have to necessarily worry about any of those things um you know, the, the absolute versus relative returns like maybe it feel you know it, maybe it would be great to lose uh you know 10% in the year that the market lost 20% but that's still a 10% loss which is still painful um, you know, so even if you relatively did well on an absolute basis, you still lost money. Um, Klarman notes, there's really only a few things that investors can do to counteract risk, diversify adequately, hedge when appropriate and invest for the margin of safety. So we'll spend a little bit of time. I'll, I'll kind of tease out some of the takeaways from Klarman's how to invest for the margin of safety. He, he very, he was very clear though, as you read through the book that you should be hedging when appropriate. Um, I would imagine that, and, and I have no insight into whether they, they've taken any action, but for example, implied volatility is extraordinarily low relative to heading into the Federal Reserve meeting tomorrow. Um, it, it, now would be a better time to put those hedges on than after if volatility were to rise meaningfully. Um, and I think he also makes the point not to be, you, know, you should you shouldn't be putting on these hedges during the crisis. You should be hedging before the crisis, which again, you, your hedges may expire worthless more times than not. But then when the crisis does come, <laughs> it's nice to have that uh, protection in place. Exactly. Uh, that's a that's a great example of focusing on the risk um, that. You know, to to be honest, that more of us uh, should do, you know, putting in the hedges, spending the time to think about what hedges make sense, and also kind of training our minds to be okay um, when when these hedges you know, don't don't pay off and they end up costing you um, consistently. Yeah, I mean that that right there. You're not going to. You shouldn't expect portfolio hedges to be to always be paying off it's just not how what they're there for um but but i think it is worth calling out that he talks about the importance of appropriately hedging as well as diversifying but then how do you get to the quote unquote investing with a margin of safety so he has three central tenants that he calls out for his approach which would be a bottom-up identification of specific undervalued securities, which could be, you, know, you, you could use a screener tool, you could obviously fish for ideas through different research services or social networks. Okay, but you are going to do it from a bottom-up method. He emphasizes the absolute performance orientation rather than relative. So. I guess as an example of that, you know, don't buy a really, you know, don't buy the best um, company in a shitty industry because it doesn't matter if that company outperforms the rest of the shit, it's still probably going to be bad. Um, pardon my language. Uh, and then being risk averse with as much attention paid to what can go wrong as right. Um, and then that's where it gets to the buy a bargain and wait. So, um, okay, so you, you do the identification of an undervalued security. Well, you need to know how to value a security to determine if it's undervalued. The next chapter, chapter eight, where he goes into the art of business valuation, he only finds there's three useful analyses in his world view. The NPV analysis, the going concern value, how would you value an operating business that is, you know, you're, you're, you're going to assume however many years of, of discrete growth, and then maybe you assume by year, whatever, seven, 10, 15, it, it reaches the rate of GDP growth or, or, or below or whatever. So that's sort of an NPV driven going concern analysis of the business. Also a liquidation value analysis, which I had gotten to do one of these recently for, <laughs> for PLVY, um, where I came to the conclusion that it is actually uh, trading below a liquidation value. Um, however, that's where things like 
governance and management and incentives, of course, and control come into the mix. If, if, you know, if you, if you, Klarman say saw an entity where the liquidation value or the breakup value was far in excess of the, um, that what the security was trading for, perhaps he would simply buy the security and liquidate it himself. Um, given now Baupost manages tens of billions of dollars. I'm not sure their current, uh, current precise AUM. Um, but, but so there's the NPV analysis, there's the liquidation value analysis, and then the third and less reliable analysis is based on stock market value, the price of a company, or and if applicable, its subsidiaries, where they would trade. So and that would be like a comp analysis, which is obviously then what are the right comps to use becomes a question. Um, you, know, you have to be intellectually honest with yourself when you're doing that analysis. So those are the three that constitute how he goes about trying to do that bottom-up identification of specific undervalued securities. Um, now clearly, look, again, he, he's a value-oriented investor, and it's also a sign of the times in which this book was written. It was written in 1991. Uh, in the late 90s, of course, not that Klarman would know at the time, um, and really over the last couple of decades since the dot-com boom and bust, you have had this ongoing shift away from tangible toward intangible uh, kind of being the drivers of value for businesses. So you know, a lot of his discussion is, is with, you know, I, I don't want to call it a legacy um, mindset, but, but definitely a more old school approach where you know, it's difficult to invest based on growth. It's a lot he, the line he says is, on the whole, it is far easier to identify the possible sources of growth for a business than to forecast how much growth will actually materialize and how it will affect profits, which is, it's always difficult to try and forecast. Even if it's a business with a long operating history, you're, you're only going to have more information to work with, which makes it easier to forecast, but it's still not, not an easy thing to do. Um, so he notes you should be making conservative projections and only invest at a substantial discount from the valuations derived therefrom. I think that's a really key thing that a lot of, especially younger folks new to the markets I've seen, you know, may, maybe they do some analysis that they decide based on their analysis, they think that company X is worth $100. Well, you wouldn't be buying company X if it traded at $100. You wouldn't be buying it even if it traded at 80 or 90 perhaps not even 70. And that's where the, the margin of safety element really comes into the mix because buying at enough of a discount to what you determine uh, the valuation to be gives you more, less risk and therefore more of that margin of safety. If you are wrong and it's not worth 100, it's instead worth 60. Well, if you bought it at 50, you thought it was 100 and it eventually became 60 after a period of time, you, know, you obviously are better suited than if you had bought it at 80, you thought it was 100 and it really is only worth 60. And now you've taken a loss. So you know, it's just a math. It's simple math, right? If, if you buy it at a lower price, all else equal, it has less risk for you. Um, but he, de he definitely, uh, I mean, talking about like how they, they think about you know, intangibles versus tangible assets is definitely more of that like Ben Graham oriented approach in this chapter. You know, like when you're talking about liquidation value, you need to exclude those intangibles, he says. Well, in today's world, there may be real value, whether it's intellectual property rights or, or some other for those intangibles. It's it's hard to know without getting into a specific, but they they he he emphasizes that liquidations act as a tether to reality for the stock market, forcing prices to move in line with actual underlying value. So you know, a liquidation value is probably going to be less than a, a going concern value or, or a stock market value, but, but at least it's giving you a good anchor to try and you know, understand, well, in the worst case, this thing gets you know, broken apart and sold off in chunks or whatever, um, what you know? What are these hard assets that we really have here? You know, he talks about net net working capital. So, 
uh, if your you know, net working capital less your long term liabilities, you actually end up with a situation where the maybe the the company you know, is trading so um, so low that it's less than the just the operating working capital. You could unwind the business, sell off you know these things, and, and potentially realize a return. Um, in, in the, like obviously, some of his discussions on stock stories and situations from you know the eighties and nineties are maybe a little less relevant today, so I won't go into it. But but I think that for his how he thinks about valuation, that kind of sums it up. Um, looking back at my notes, it's it's those three different means of analyzing what the security value should be, uh, and then buying with enough of a margin of safety for it. Um, He also talks about, yeah, I'll, I'll pause there though um, before I go on to the next topic. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely, you know, when you think about <laughs> the market today, like if so many companies are trading at levels where it, even still it's, you know, there are not earnings, the company is not making money, it has never made money, it, it's worth many billions of dollars, but it's never turned a profit. Um, and then you try to think about, you know, well, what if you paused and you were to just you know, say, yeah, you know, we're going to liquidate the company. What is it worth? Well, it's probably worth a heck of a lot less than the valuation that's being ascribed to it. And these would not be investments that a margin of safety oriented investor would be likely finding themselves in. And I think it was true for probably a lot of value investors were under uh, allocated to technology companies that had a lot of these intangible assets that maybe they were able to realize scale um, like Apple and Microsoft and, and Amazon and uh, Google, you know, incredible scale economies globally that software obviously with marginal cost near zero. Um, it's just a, a very different business model than a real business that makes widgets or, um, you know, sells goods. Um, but it's, it's, it's still, again, it's, it's harder to get it right and you're inherently taking on more risk if you're looking at those high flyers that are you know, trading at rich valuations when you try to do it from a fundamentals basis. Okay, I'll, I'll keep talking through kind of the value investment process. So you know, he talks as well about the challenge of finding attractive investments and that you, he, he talks about there being three categories of um, of value investment niche niches. He talks about securities that are selling at a discount to break up or liquidation value, which we just talked about liquidation value. Um, I think those are fewer today than maybe during his time, and they don't come across all as often. Rate of return situations, so that would be about the business's ongoing operations, and then asset conversion opportunities. Um, when the reason for the undervaluation can be clearly identified, it becomes an even better investment because the outcome is more predictable. So you know, he, he talks about, well, if it's a, the price of security is too low, then maybe certain institutions won't be able to touch it. Uh, if it has a small float or it trades in a market that it's obscure, um, or there's some calendar based selling, right? The year end tax loss selling is of course something that impacted a lot of stocks or could be thought to have impacted a lot of stocks this past year. So um, definitely this idea that, you know, if you're looking in places that they've already been shunned and they're, you know, if you can understand why they're being shunned, that's helpful to reduce your, um, your uncertainty and your, increase your predictability. Um, because he, yeah, he makes the vital point that, high uncertainty is frequently accompanied by low prices. By the time the uncertainty is resolved, prices are likely to have risen. Investors frequently benefit from making investment decisions with less than perfect knowledge and are well rewarded for bearing the risk of uncertainty. The time investors, other investors spend delving into the last unanswered detail may cost them a chance to buy in at prices so low they offer a margin of safety despite the incomplete information. So he does note the 80-20 rule and that eventually... There's only so much fundamental analysis that you can do and you're going to get subjected to diminishing returns. And I know I can say, having seen that firsthand with a few of the stocks uh, 
in the last couple of years where I've gotten extremely in the weeds on. And he's right. At some point, the marginal benefit of you turning over some really um, nuanced, I guess, perspective on the stock is, is that really going to make or break your investment thesis? Um, and are you spending you know, time that you could be spending more productively elsewhere? Which I think is a really good call out because you know, the, the, the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule, whatever you want to call it, uh, eventually there is a diminishing returns um, for how much time you spend on your fundamental analysis. And knowing, I think, when to kind of cut that off is, is a skill to learn over time. All right, there's uh, a couple other then chapters. I'm almost through kind of the items I wanted to call out. So, so he noted as well that you know, in chapter 10, areas of opportunity for value investors, catalysts, market inefficiencies, and institutional constraints. So catalysts vary in their potency. You could have a spinoff. You could have a recapitalization, a major asset sale, um, he notes that the orderly sale or liquidation of a business leads to total value realization. Um, he gave some examples of complex securities and risk arbitrage and spinoffs. I think that the challenge becomes uh, some of the minutia and the details with some of these. And inherently, if, if it's a difficult, if it's difficult for you, a lay person to kind of, fully understand the risks in the picture, it's going to be difficult for most. Um, and perhaps you know, the opportunity will arise uh, in those situations. You know, he talks, he spends a couple chapters on bank thrifts and on um, distressed and bankrupt securities. Um, again, th these are, I think, areas that in the coming year or two, we might see more of than we have in the last a uh, few years, but you know, there's he definitely cites meaningful opportunity to to invest at different stages of whether it's you know a company files a chapter eleven let's say Bed Bath and Beyond is likely to file this um, at some point in the coming weeks, but perhaps uh, you know he would make a, a determination that the value of this retailer because of its unique exposure to the baby market, uh, maybe he would make a determination that you know there's actually some opportunity for equity. I'm just spitballing here because I don't I don't think <laughs> in that securities case it's going to make sense. But um, he does note, quote, bankrupt securities tend to behave somewhat like risk arbitrage investments. They fluctuate in price more with the progress of the reorganization than with the overall market. So going to likely have a lot of idiosyncratic risk with that security, but you're probably going to be untethered to what's going on in the macro economy. If it's uh, you know, a, a business going through a restructuring or uh, somewhere along that, that process. Um, and really, I think the last couple chapters were, were good discussions on portfolio management I bolded it onto line this line, quote, there is only one valid rule for selling. All investments are for sale at the right price. Clearly, Mr. Klarman is not of the never sell philosophy. I abhor the concept of never sell. There is a price for everything. I am strongly in agreement with Mr. Klarman there. Um, and, and like, it's just so vital to not get married to your investments. Uh, if if there's a price at which the investment is undervalued, there will a price there will be a price at which the investment is overvalued. Clearly, GameStop GME was overvalued come late January two years ago, and uh, while it pained me to be fully exited from the security, I knew it was overvalued and it was certainly for sale, and it was better than the right price for me. So. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on like never sell. Uh, I see that on FinTwit a lot, but I, clearly Mr. Klarman does not fit in that camp. On, are you a never seller? It's a great question. <laughs> um, well, it's uh, so this is actually relatively a recent kind of change in my mindset um, when I when I read this book is. Um, 
the the idea that inertia is also a decision. You know, if you don't sell, that's a decision that you're making. So it's really impossible to avoid any kind of decision making once you're in the game. And I say this is something that I haven't thought about that much. You know, I just at times, you know, I would just never sell <laughs> without any reason and, and and not think deeply about what that means for for my future. Um, but you know, going through the crazy market volatility and um, you know, experiencing these ups and downs kind of made me think that I should be more you know, thoughtful in making decisions. And when I decide to not sell, then I should have a good reason not to sell. But obviously, you know, never selling because other people are saying um, that they're never going to sell is, is not the smartest approach here. Yeah, I think it, it's important. I, I don't think what Klarman is saying is that you should be actively trading in and out of your investments. That's not what he's saying at all. What he's trying to get the point across is that if, you, if you've if you come to an intrinsic value for the business, you have a sense for what you think it's worth, then you there has to be a, a point at which you would be selling. And you know, it, you're otherwise getting into a speculation if, if you're holding the business only because you have these whatever thoughts, emotions that attachment around the business and why you think it is so wonderful. Um, well, if your analysis showed it's worth 100 and it's trading at 200, why are you holding it? It just, it's, it, it would be irrational. Um, he, he, you know, he does note, right? Like in that chapter on portfolio management, selling is the hardest decision because you've done all this work. You've, you know, however many months or years have waited for this security to see that value be realized. And now it's done. So um, the quote he, he had in the book was as the president of a small firm specializing in trading illiquid over the counter stocks once told me, quote, you have to feed the birdies when they are hungry, <laughs> unquote. So he, he definitely makes the point in that chapter on portfolio management that it's it's a never ending process. You're you're looking for new investments. You're trying to only swing at the fat pitches. You're trying to approach it with a value oriented mindset of I can come up with a, an idea of what intrinsic value is, and if I can get it at a steep enough discount to that, then it could be a good investment, and then. You know, you're going to have various securities throughout their life of, you know, as you watch the quarters go by and the company report results, if your investment thesis is disproven, maybe you were wrong in your assessment of intrinsic value and you need to cut the dead wood um, or it gets fully valued. Well, then you realize the return. And obviously there's tax considerations for everybody depending on their circumstance, but you, you, you would continue on it's a never-ending process and and he does really call it out that you know, it, it is a real well he calls it a full-time job um you you can definitely obviously for, for those of us who are here speaking who are part of an investment firm it is a full-time job for us but there is a lot of folks out in the market who have real full-time jobs and who don't necessarily have the time to spend 40 plus hours a week on investing. He, again, this is 1991. So I think that part of this is, is due to the, when the book was written, you know, he, he talks about, you need to then find a, you know, a good money manager or a mutual fund or a discretionary broker. Uh, if you aren't going to put in the time yourself, um, you know, obviously today we, we have exchange traded funds <laughs> that are more tax efficient, more liquid and better than mutual funds, all else equal. Um, didn't have those. You've got these robo advisors. You've got target date funds. You've got so many different things that didn't exist when he wrote this book. Um, but yeah, it, he definitely does drive home the point in his view, though, that investing is a full time job and to have long term success, sporadic effort is unlikely to realize that. Uh, and that he sees a significant ongoing commitment of time as a prerequisite. I, I think there's a spectrum of answers there, but Han, I know for you, you've obviously 
been learning a lot about a lot of these concepts as we all have um, over the past year and change now as we've begun this journey together. But how, how do you feel about his perspective there on investing needing to be a full-time job? Putting out right. So, so I, I think this is where Clarin is very old fashioned and, and exactly like you pointed out, this is an old book. And when this was written, it was just very hard to you know gather any kind of information about companies. So it made sense to, um, say say this right say that part-time or sporadic effort um, has little chance of success this is no longer true and this is largely what um, you know our company's thesis is based on is that people because of technology and because uh, of, of how technology enables our information consumption and our communication um, with people all across the world anyone can be a part-time investor right and, and we're betting on the fact that anyone can really be a long-term, you know, successful part-time investor, and we're trying to harness the power of bringing those people together and giving them the platform to to, to discuss into the crowdsource research. Um, and you know that wouldn't happen if uh, what Clarin is saying here is true. Um, if you know there is no true success in investing without a full-time commitment. You know, if this were true, then um, you know, all this rise in retail investing and, and all these very sophisticated investors that we see online, you know, on Twitter, on, 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 on you know, Reddit, all these other social platforms, they're very talented and they have, um, you know, they have deep insight with expertise that they're willing to share with the world. And that is really value adding. Um, and that saves a lot of time for, you know, lay people like us because this, um, you know, very well thought out opinions are freely posted online for us to just take advantage of and see. So, you know, all, all of these things happening at once at a very fast pace. And I think the barrier um, of the, the barrier of having full time job in investing and being successful is going to get lower and lower. Um, it all has already gotten significantly low, but it's we're only going to see it get lower in the future. Um, and, and ideally, you know, we'll get more people to join the retail investor movement, you know, figure out the tools to educate themselves and, and learn and develop the discipline and consistency to keep turning on the hidden rocks um, to find these opportunities and bargains in the market. And of course, share the findings um, online with other people so everyone can benefit together. Yeah, that. I was looking up because I didn't know offhand when the first search engine was created. It was actually, apparently the name of it was Archie and it debuted at the end of 1990. So understandably, Mr. Klarman <laughs> didn't, you know, the investors of his time when this book was written didn't have access to Google. <laughs> there was no such thing. But I, I wholeheartedly agree with the sentiment that you just shared. And we've, we've witnessed it firsthand over the last couple of years that as the barrier to communication and information transfer continues to drop globally, it's easier and easier for investors with even less time at their disposal for investing to, I think, uncover those nuanced nuggets of information from folks who might be experts in a certain area. And as you said, and that's really the, the novel thesis we have at Wook is that we believe that you can achieve investment alpha through the crowdsourced research sharing that, that has been going on. It's been going on for years, but it's accelerated even further in the last few. So yeah, I think we both push back on Mr. Carmen's sentiment there, but understandably, you know, at the time it was written, things were certainly a lot different. Um, again, if anyone in the audience has any thoughts, wants to chime in, please don't hesitate to request to be a speaker. It's, we're a little over an hour in, um, depending on how much more folks want to chime in or not. We'll, we'll continue either through the bottom of the hour, um, possibly through to the top of the next, if we have enough conversation. Um, let me see. There was a couple of other points that he made in portfolio management that I wanted to note. So this one, I think, is is really key so it's like there's this there's this uh saying i guess some financial 
managers like to say losers, average losers. Well, in Mr. Klarman's view, if the security you are per considering is truly a good investment, not a speculation, you would certainly want to own more at lower prices. If prior to purchase, you realize that you are unwilling to average down, then you probably should not make the purchase in the first place. I think that's a really tough one because when to average down versus when to cut bait is, is a really difficult question. And I think Mr. Klarman's answer would be in the lines of, well, if you, you bought it at a steep, you, you made this investment at a steep discount to your determination of intrinsic value, unless something changes that would reduce your estimation of intrinsic value, whether the liquidation would now be meaningfully lower or the going concern value of this operating business has been impaired in some capacity, why would you not be averaging down because the price is now representing a more attractive entry? And I think it's, it's a challenge because the, the nuance there is if nothing has happened to your assessment of intrinsic value, clearly if the stock goes down 50%, um, you're going to be searching, and and if you're an analyst, your your portfolio manager is going to want to know. Somebody's going to want to know why did it go down. And uh, sometimes there's there's not a simple and easy answer, and um, there may not have been any explicit event or uh, or reason for for it to decline in price, and, and to try to suss out the why for that can be a challenge. But um, you, it, it, again, his example, though, is if it is truly a good investment and, and it does not change, then you should be willing to average down. Otherwise, you shouldn't be buying it at all. But Jordan, hey there. Go ahead. You're not on mute, but I cannot hear you. I'm not sure if anyone else... Can. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. So I agree with you a hundred percent on on the the conversation regarding intrinsic value. Um where if you you buy something that that you believe is at a really good price and it goes down, then and your your belief in its value has not changed, then yes, of course you should you should continue to average down. How do you, how do you manage risk while doing that? Well, I think you have to consider it in the context of a, what should be a diversified portfolio, right? If it's already you know an outsized position for you, uh, then I think. I would have to weigh what are the alternatives that I have. Do I have any other ideas that are competing for the capital? Is the alternative to hold cash? Will I be left with an unsatisfactorily large pool of cash if I were to you know, av proceed with averaging down? Um, it's always, a, I guess, going to vary. But I, like those are, would be some of the things I would consider uh, in my personal account if you know, if one of the securities that I had had a steep drop, um, I can I can think of, and it's also of course going to be tough because you're going to, especially with like what happened in the past year, many securities declined meaningfully in price uh, across the spectrum. Obviously, the frothiest things seemingly the most, but um, I guess in, in a situation like that, your overall portfolio allocation won't be meaningfully changed if everything moves roughly similarly. Um, so I guess in the scenario with just one thing that is like the outlier, uh, yeah, I would, I would really kind of sharpen my pencil back on the, like the security itself. Like why has it idiosyncratically underperformed everything else? Um, and has, is there a balance sheet issue? You know, one thing that happened a lot over the last year was, you know, in an era of free money, the concerns of, well, you know, how much runway do you have uh, in terms of needing to tap capital markets for incremental debt or equity raises, 
um, you know, were not things people were as worried about at the end of 2021 as they were at the end of 2022. So like, I would definitely want to you know, think through those sorts of considerations because, because maybe there's a risk for the company that uh, you know, they're going to have to sell equity and, and maybe that's why the equity price is sold off. Um, but yeah, I guess hopefully that's a satisfactory like bit of the thinking that, that would be going on in my head. Han, I don't know if you've had anything on your side. Um, so first of all, uh, thank, thank you for the question, Jordan. Um, so it, it is tricky, right? When we see, like, let's say there's a company that we really like and we started buying and the price drops. Um, and, you know, because we want to average down, we keep buying. And, and obviously that carries risk because, you know, the portion of the company in your portfolio is only going to increase and that, ha that will impact the overall portfolio risk. Um, so your question is, how do we manage that risk, right? And I think the most effective way is to think about diversification um, in your portfolio. And when you are averaging down on a specific company that's falling, then you, know, you should always zoom out and look at the portfolio and look at the blended you know, risk um, of all the diversified stocks that you have in the portfolio. But also remember that, um, as Connor says in this book, you know, diversification is not about how many different things you own but how different the things you do own are in the risks they entail. So we, also, we always need to think about, you know, is my, is, is my portfolio, um, you know, risk neutral if I'm going to double down on this specific stock? Yeah. You know, I, I think it's always important to yeah, yeah, I go think ahead. You, I think you answered it. That, that, was, that was exactly what I was looking for. I think that's, that's really interesting, right? When you increase risk somewhere, then that you really believe in strongly, you can then look elsewhere in your portfolio where you can uh, reduce your risk where you may believe less strongly in it, right? But therefore you effectively maintain your current risk levels, but you increase the intrinsic value of your portfolio because you've, you've reallocated assets to something you, you believe has higher value. Exactly, exactly. Um, so, you know, the... The really um, like actionable things that we can do uh, in, in this type of scenario is just making sure that we do the research to have the conviction um, in the value that the company that we're trying to um, you know, allocate more capital towards and constantly reevaluating the, the blended risk of the entire portfolio instead of just focusing on, on a few things. And, and I think it, it's counterintuitive, but again, assuming there hasn't been some meaningful deterioration in that securities business, um, it, it's probably less risky to add incremental capital at more attractive valuations relative, you know, again, to where you're over, you're, where you had initially invested in it. But but I think that's where Han is correctly noting it's in the context of your overall portfolio you definitely need to think about the uh, the various risks going on um yeah because Klarman notes that in his view you don't need to have hundreds of different holdings he's his view quote the number of securities that should be owned to reduce portfolio risk to an acceptable level is not great as few as 10 to 15 different holdings usually suffice Right. It's it's always tricky to you know, it's it's easy to you know to say it like this to to say that you know we always have to look think about the risk control the risk blah blah, blah but but it's very hard to do it in practice um, and you know it, it all begins with the conceptual understanding you know through reading a book like Margin of Safety um, to to really kind of like guide our thinking towards you know focusing more on the risk and the diversification and hedging and, and all these different methods to, you know, to keep the, to, to uh, maintain the balance of the overall portfolio, you know, while also exploring other opportunities um, and doing the research and keeping up the discipline while also, like, like we said before, filtering out all the new information from the world um, and, you know, filtering out all, all the noise and focusing on what, what's important to us. You know, everything has to go in parallel. And, and that's why, you know, um, 
investing is so difficult. It's like a 4D art, right? It constantly changes and, and we're trying to constantly get closer to the truth. And, um, but again, I, hopefully uh, reading books, reading classical investment related books like, like, like this, um, you know, I think uh, can be beneficial to all of us. As he puts it, the hard part is discipline, patience, and judgment. Uh, it, it really is just applying those things in practice and, and trying to be consistent with your approach. Um, see Jordan jump down, but any of the folks in the audience, if any of you guys wanted to chime in, ask any questions, share any of your thoughts, please don't hesitate. Uh, otherwise, Han, um, we'll probably wrap pretty soon here. Uh, I think there was one point that we didn't talk about yet that I'm just skimming back through the notes that I had bolded that he noted that value investing is predicated on the efficient market hypothesis being wrong, which in the strong form efficient market hypothesis that says that there is no information that would benefit investors. All information is priced in, which I personally don't believe. And clearly Mr. Klarman doesn't believe the weak form of the efficient market hypothesis says past prices, past prices provide no useful info on future direction, which would imply that technical analysis is a waste of time. And, uh, doesn't work or help, which is Mr. Klarman's view, at least in 1991 it was. And then the semi-strong view on efficient markets is that no published information will help investors since the market has discounted all publicly available info. Which again, I think that's where I we clearly believe and we saw firsthand and we were able to execute on this that you can obtain non-published information to inform how well businesses operations are going in an era of e-commerce. If you have a way to see their order numbers, uh, just simply by virtue of them being sequential, that can provide you some information that, um, you know, the, the quote unquote, you know, strong form of the efficient market hypothesis would say that's not a benefit to investors. I, I would push back on that. And I think Mr. Klarman would also push back on that. Um, which again is our kind of thesis with what capital management that we think we can get nuggets of information from a wide array of investors and individuals across experience levels and market focuses to, to hopefully know more than, uh, or at least get some insight beyond what the market is seeing and pricing. JP, I know you haven't had a chance to chime in and I keep putting Han on the spot. Um, were there any takeaways from the book that we hadn't covered yet that had struck you? Um, yeah, I mean, it was it, it, like a lot of the content actually kind of was very similar to the most important thing. But obviously, like, there was other points that were made. But, like, I like the chapter two where they kind of talked about Wall Street, how they're not really in our team. What's good for them may not necessarily be good for us. So they're in it for the fees. And obviously, they're compensated very highly for their work. So um, they're more of a marketing marketing people, sales people, rather than finance people. And they're constantly creating new vehicles to – make more money. So even though their ratings of buy or hold or all of these things really doesn't mean anything because a lot of the a lot of the times they they're lagged and they don't even consider other components like recessions or anything like that. So um it's almost like we have to acknowledge that they're not on our team and we have to constantly we have to understand that we have to find our own ways to really find alpha and be successful. So I thought chapter two was pretty good, um, as well as chapter three. It was kind of like very similar in the concept that, you know, these managers, you know, they're focused on their own compensations and they are not even investing in the things that they recommend. So um, that was interesting. Uh, index fund, like pretty much 
this was a very interesting idea because he doesn't believe in index funds and pretty much believes that, you know, if you purchase an index fund, you, you're not really focused on the fundamentals. You're and you don't even have voting rights. Um, and yeah, so I thought that was interesting. And it's like if you are buying an index, you're looking for average returns. And that's not what you should technically be going for. Um, so. Yeah, so very interesting. So, oh, EBITDA, what you already mentioned that. I thought that was pretty fun too. Um, pretty much, uh, I, I was looking into it and Charles Munger also thinks EBITDA is bullshit. And it makes sense. It always kind of, I always thought that as well. Why is EBITDA relevant when depreciation and amortizations are legitimate expenses? Why are we not considering those things? Why are we, why do people even care? Well, that's all because Wall Street wants higher premiums and multiples. So there's all these hidden um intentions by all these organizations and we got to find our own way to really be successful so we have to be contrarian we have to be conservative and finding that you know bigger margin of safety is really what we need to be going for and not just like a mediocre margin of safety something that could protect us even if we do make the bad decision and we yeah. make the the there's a whole bunch of errors that can happen and if we can still make a profit, um, then that's something to invest in. And that's the appropriate margin of safety that we should be striving for. So, but yeah, I mean, there's so many th great points in this book I, 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 and you've covered most of it. So I won't okay. reiterate the same thing, but yeah, great, great book. Good. Well, we obviously, it, it was very much, I think, like a little bit of a cousin to Mr. Mark's most important thing. I think Klarman and Marx had a lot in common. So um, we'll have to, you know, I think that for our next book, I'd like, um, there's, there was a couple, there were a couple of recommendations. One had more to do with the process, I think, of doing kind of your own on-ground due diligence um, I'm, the name of the book is eluding me right now, but I will, we'll get settled on it sometime this week and we'll get it posted. And that way people can, can read ahead for this, uh, for next month's book club. Um, it's yeah, there, I have a couple of recommendations that we might be able to run with, but okay. Then um, it's not seeing anyone with hands raised or, or coming up to speak, I think we've, we've hit the nail on the head for covering margin of safety. It's, it's really not that complicated. It's really a very straightforward, do a lot of work researching companies, trying to find companies that have the right characteristics that you would want to invest in and buy them when they are a bargain and they represent a bargain. I think, I think one thing we didn't talk about that Carmen definitely did talk about in the book is the importance of uh, you know, buying when the opportunity presents itself. He, he talks about, especially if you're managing a large sum of money, that you know, volume is essential for you to enter a position as, as well as exit. We didn't talk much about liquidity, but, but liquidity and illiquidity, or illiquidity in particular, of course, is a real risk. But he definitely talks about when you... And when, when stocks are falling, say, and, and there are forced sellers, those are the best times to be in the market as a buyer. When people are being forced to sell, whether it's leverage leading to a liquidation or there's some external reason why uh, a large shareholder has to sell out of the stock or other, you know, those are the times when you can find these really attractive um, entry points, margins of safety. Uh, to get into your investment. So so I, I will try to find us a book that's a little more on some practical tools to potentially arm us with um, conducting our own analysis for next month. If anyone has any recommendations or ideas in the Whoop Discord server, we have a book club channel and I would happily welcome any input. Um, we will be back tomorrow night with our market open mic series that we've been hosting most Wednesdays. I'm going to push it to 7.30. Um, of course, we'll be back on Friday with our look in review. We have a lot to cover this week with the Federal Reserve meeting tomorrow uh, and Powell's press conference at 2. 
and then Apple, Amazon, and Google all reporting on Thursday, uh, top of the companies that have already reported this week and earlier in earnings season. So the, this week's Look and Review will be focused on the big tech earnings season results and guides, as well as where the Federal Reserve appears to be taking us um, after we listen to Mr. Powell tomorrow afternoon. Um, I will be participating in a podcast on Allison Transmission that we will share once it is published. So I look forward to sharing my fun facts about trucks with more folks. And yes, so thanks those of you who tuned in for our third book, book club. We will be back next month, the last Tuesday of every month at 8 o'clock. Again, apologies. We have two members of the team. Uh, one had a family. Um Unfortunately, passing in the family, uh, another had a, a last minute uh, call that, that disrupted things. But we hope to all be back as a group and join next month when we present our next book. So thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in and for your interest in Wolf Capital Management. Um, be sure to check out Wolf.gg, our Discord, if you'd like to share some feedback on the book club. And we will talk to you soon. Have a great rest of your evening, everybody. Thank you, Rod. Thank you, everyone. Uh, looking forward to the open mic tomorrow and also our next book club discussion next month. Thank you.